Those people lived in bondage for five years. And they existed, they didn't live. They started getting into Holland and the Germans dug down, started to fight back. And that's when Jerry started sending out these V-bombs. They were the darndest things, you know. They sounded like a motorcycle without a muffler. And you knew when they were coming. And all of a sudden we ran over tenement mines, took the track off and everything, and it was a blaze. When I came to, I was about 30, 40 feet from where the drink gun carrier was. There was a haystack. It turned out that it was a camouflaged 88 gun, and they are deadly guns. It's called enfilade fire, which is sideways fire. So they had placed machine guns lengthways to the canal so they could fire down the canal and shoot the hell out of this. But at the same time, we knew the Germans were on the run and uh, and an animal on the run is vicious. Like it was mostly on the dikes where we were fighting. Like, and we'd be dug in one dike and across the other side, like there's water in between, and then the Germans would be on the other. And of course, they kept them, any of the places there was dikes like that that they were traveling on, they kept them covered with uh, fire all the time, or acrylic fire or something like that all the time. He didn't do much moving around, but all we were doing was taking bearings of, of German gunfire. And if you see a troop movement, you took bearings, and then our artillery was to bomb. And patrols became another thing uh, where we would be patrolling every night. There were different type of patrols. There was a listening patrol, there were fighting patrols, there were uh, capture patrols. You get in a loaded buffalo, you can't have too many waves because you may be six inches to three inches to the water. We thought we were hungry, but we weren't hungry at all. We just thought we were. And there was about seven or eight children of age of maybe 10, something like that, standing there with a hungry look on their face. We all gave them our, our breakfast. We didn't take any. I saw for the first time in my life cases of what they called starvation edema. Edema is a swelling of the body. And this occurred in children. And there was a little girl in the storefront, she had a Brussels sprout, and there was no sprouts on it. She was just chewing on the, on the, on the stalk. And there were three other little children who were just as hungry as she was. And they stalked her like wolves. And the ones you joined up with and, and went into battle with are becoming less and less. Then mentally you're, you become that you know it's your turn next. It just has to be because they're all gone. I got hit side of the head, I guess, helmet. These doctors said that's what saved my life with a helmet because it took one eye out completely, damaged the other one. I was standing on the seat and it blew me out. The rest incinerated right there. They never did get out. That was on the 3rd of May. The war was over on the 5th of May. And the greatest thing for the morale of troops is in the front line is to know that there are first aid facilities, ambulances and so on, right there in the front. They had uh, a casualty clearing station. Uh, casualties were brought into the casualty clearing station and were shipped back to, uh, to hospitals. Just taking an extra minute to just stop by the bedside and say, well, how are you today? Have you heard from home? These kinds of things were what made the difference in the, in the lives of the wounded, I think. When we were in that hospital, the water main got broken, and a bunch of these ladies got together when we had no water, and they formed a bucket brigade, 
And they were coming across there with their bucket and laughing and talking. And, and a machine gunner shot them all down right in the middle of the road. Uh. We were clearing the house one night and I walked up and I kicked this door open. Door across the room flew open. Guy stand there and I started lifting up the rifle. He started lifting his up. And I said, this guy's going to beat me. So I pulled the trigger anyway, you know, I figured if I could scare him, I'd maybe get another shot at myself in the full length mirror across the room. So I shot myself in the mirror. <laughs> I took the pin out of the grenade and I just held and it was left in this hand and throw it away like the other one. And I was had it ready to go. And there was another noise, I just go roll it down the stairs and I heard a baby crying. You're never the same person if you ever take somebody else's life. It does something to you. Down the road comes the German army that we opened fire. We caught all them. They didn't even know we were there because I was a butcher and all that kind of. But it was war. And then I got the word from the set that I was to open up with the flamethrowers. And you realize that there are human beings there. So you know what I did? I got the Padre. I wanted somebody to tell me this was okay. I mean, you don't burn people alive. I didn't join the army for that. It's the easiest thing in the world to kill a person. It is, but it's awful hard to live with it afterwards. I thought if I hadn't killed him, he'd be a grandfather like me. And he would have. He had two children, I have three grandchildren now, and I... We'd be traveling along the roads in, in Holland, and we see rifles piled up sky high. They just throw the rifles on, on one pile there, and, uh, and uh, they were just, they knew the war was over, eh? 12, 14, and 15-year-old kids and 60 and 70-year-old men it was really sickening to see it. And this is what this proud nation had come to. Eh? They were put into compounds, and our job was to prevent the uh, resistance movement from getting in and killing them, because they'd given up all their arms and were all, all there, which was a funny job, position to be in. The Dutch were, you know, they, had been, they joined in with the uh, Germans and had the Holland's Dutch SS. We had a lot of them there. You understand too that they were there for, there were soldiers there for six years. A lot of those girls probably had married German soldiers or they had mixed with them. Anybody had done anything like that, they were outcasts. They'd throw them up in the air and uh, in a blanket and uh, shave all their hair off and then let them out. And they'd, they, these girls would go up, put kerchiefs on their heads, lean out the window and watch the others being humiliated. And the order we heard on the guns, we never heard since D-Day. Cease fire, empty guns. The war was over. I can understand why you kiss the soil that you come back to. You come back to freedom. And everybody had something orange on for the House of Orange. You know, armbands and little girls had hair ribbons. and. They sang their beautiful national anthem, and they had their own flags. It was wonderful. And they even took their, their people who were sick in their beds out there so they could see us. They'd shake hands and touch us, give us flowers. Women galore, trying to get at you, you know, just to, to shake your hand or kiss you or bring you flowers. I mean, it was... It was just, Oh God, it was, it was hard to describe because there were so many people. It doesn't come free. We've given up an awful lot and they're out there under the stones. <laughs> <laughs>